And welcome back everyone to the English coverage of the International Wildcard Invitational. My name is Julian Pastry Time Card. Joining with me once again, Christopher Popper, Smithy Smith. A great first game for our personal coverage here as we saw C take out Turkey in an upset game there as well. But arguably an even bigger game coming up now as well as Oceani as the Chiefs takes on Brazil's Ints. And we have to take that, leave that last curveball behind as we saw, of course, the unfavored Bangkok Titans step up big against Turkey's favorites, Besiktas. Suddenly now we have what some analysts have predicted might actually be a preview of the grand final as the Chiefs take on Ince. And Ince in particular, most people's heavy favorites coming into this tournament. Yeah, really strong side. And it makes sense again in the wildcard regions. You know, there's definitely been pro leagues around for varying amounts of time. Oceano, of course, just getting their, their, uh, their one on board this year. Brazil's been around for quite a long time as far as wildcard regions go. And that ingrain pro scene that they've built up over the last year or two years has really shown you because they've got some very strong sides. I mean, there's actually a couple of factors working against Ince in this game. Their match against Keed All Stars was, what, two, three days ago? at this point they're definitely going to be coming off very little sleep you know of a lot of international flights from brazil to turkey there's definitely some out of game factors that will affect them but man they looked so good taking down key all stars of course a team that contains such world favorites the likes of emperor and daydream taking them down confidently in the final and this all brazilian lineup comes in heavy favorites but still with a lot of work and a lot of things to show yeah strong looking side but before we get into it let's take a quick and a closer look at the chiefs So we have competed abroad before, uh, about a year ago at WCG, but uh, since our hiatus from the international scene, it's, it definitely feels awesome to be back here again, competing abroad. I think as a, as a team, we would, we, we would really like to take out this tournament because we want to put OC on the map. It's, it's known as probably one of the weaker regions and yeah, I, I don't think a lot of us believe that, so we just want to show, show what we've got. I think the toughest team heading into it will be the Turkish team. Uh, just based on the videos that we've watched, they seem the most structured and uh, individually probably the best players. So yeah, looking forward to playing them. They seem like a solid team. Uh, as a team, our goal is definitely to win. It sounds really you know, cliche, everyone wants to win, but I definitely think we, we have enough, we, our players are really talented, we practice a lot, our teamwork is really good. I think we definitely can be the best team at Wildcards and our goal is to win. Uh, Oceania as a region is definitely developing really fast at the moment. And um, before us and Legacy were only really the teams that were arguably at a top level, but now with all this young talent coming through and the region developing really quickly, I think we're ready to make an impact on the global stage. Competing abroad, I'm, it's kind of a weird feeling because it's not the same as being at home because it's kind of like it's an outside environment. It's kind of, it's really different because like being in Turkey is, I mean, we've been to Germany before in China and like Turkey is just, it's like it's really like busy like everywhere is just going so I guess oh, I don't know Oceania Esports has really developed this past year um, with the OPL the introduction of the OPL I mean all teams kind of somewhat getting more of a salary pay rather than just purely from tournaments I think just based off that infrastructure it encourages a lot more players a lot more depth within Oceania and I think that will definitely reflect in the amount of skill that the top level that the top Oceania team, so us, would like demonstrate. Well, we'll have to see if the Chiefs' new training in the Oceanic Pro League can help them here because they did again mention Turkey, one of the top competitors looking in. We just saw the upset win by Southeast Asia over that side and they again have an arguably even bigger challenge here against the Brazilians. Yeah, definitely time for some giant killing if you're a Chiefs fan for them to take down Ince. We have to mention though, it's a very settled lineup coming through from the Chiefs. Of course, these five players have been together since sometime in 2013, one of the most settled lineups of any of the teams in the world, you'd have to say. So they come in very confident after a victory in our first game of the night. 
it was an interesting one to watch, you know, watching it in the back, seeing them really struggle at level one with a late game team fight comp, but they managed to get it back there in the mid game. They lost the minimum. Suddenly, Oriana and Hecarim got really big and they took out the game. And their late game uh, synergy and, and shot calling seemed really solid. I was impressed by their team play in that game, but. We've noted that a lot of sides here at this tournament look aggressive, and if they fall too far behind of a side that have as much experience as this one, they could find themselves all of a sudden in an even bigger hole that they're unable to crawl out of this time. Absolutely. I think if they repeat that early game performance, an aggressive jungler like the likes of Revolta coming through from Ints will just punish them. And I think just Ints as one of those top-tier teams, especially at the IWCI, will punish the mistakes that Chase put a lot more severely than the opposition they found in game one. Yeah, and of course, our thoughts as well. Of course, we're showing them here for you guys. We'd love to get your thoughts on the matter there as well. If, get on Twitter and get use the hashtag IWCI and let us know who's your favorite team, who you're cheering for, just how you're watching or who you're staying up to see. And of course, as well, if you're an Oceania viewer watching, you want to support the Chiefs specifically, you can use the hashtag IMOCE. We definitely want to hear all the fan voices, all the fan messages. If you're watching from OCN, it's going to be very late now already. So if you're burning the midnight oil for the Chiefs, please do get in there and cheer. And of course, we want to know how you're watching, guys, as well. So use that same IWCI hashtag as well. But get us a photo of your setup, your sick lounge, whatever's going on. Team of hats on the feet we've seen already. Crazy stuff happening on. Again, from all around the world, we want to know how you guys are watching. Yeah, I mean, the big trend has definitely been feet. So maybe move away from that show or something, something different. Yep. But uh, moving into this game that we're coming up, Ince versus the Chiefs, as we said, could potentially be that grand final preview. It's definitely going to be one of the top games here. How does the level one go? Because, of course, it was a disaster for the Chiefs in their first game. And I have to think if we even want to look at uh, specifically in the matchup where we can look to to see who's really going to take over the game for either of these teams. I think it has to be the jungle matchup there, Papa Smithy. Some pretty similar, uh, some influential junglers for both sides, despite having, I would say, fairly opposing play styles. Yeah, Revolta and Spooks, definitely both playmakers for their team, however you classify their champion. Paul Spooks in particular, as well known for the likes of Elise, obviously one of the strongest aggressive counter jungles or skirmishes, and the likes of Zack that he's moved to on patch 5.6. Not really a Sejuani player, but really does like the long range engage of the likes of Zack, whereas Revolta. I mean, if you're going to choose a star player from the top team, it's probably going to be their jungler. Yeah, which is crazy to think. We haven't seen too many carry junglers in a while, but Revolta, the big star for his team, loves the Nidalee especially, who you can hard carry games on from the jungle position as well. So again, two very important members for both sides, but they're going to be doing something different. Revolta wants to get ahead and carry the game on his own, and Spooks wants to enable the rest of his team to carry with him. And we're just interested to see in on this international stage, Revolta, they came, I mean, the lineup, you have to say, came to the lineup very late. He's actually the newest member of the team, but suddenly catapulted into being that big decision maker. Really, the acid test is how Revolta goes in the early game when we're talking about potential ints victories. So he's going to have to be really on top of his game because as we said, Spooks, he's no slouch from the Chiefs. No, and it'd be weird to me if this, this whole tournament sort of developed into the Oceanic side, who are honestly known like a lot of the teams who ended up at this tournament for early game aggression, for snowballing in the mid game, for them to fall back and be the team that tries to outscale everybody else. And I have to think that in general, this game will definitely be a lot of strategies like the likes of the lane swap, a lot of a tit for tat. You, there won't be free objectives, I think, seeded by either of these teams. Definitely going to be a trades of objectives, trades of turrets. And whoever can get that big momentum, honestly, who can ever can start monopolizing the Dragon? I mean, Dragon's probably the clearest win condition in these matches so far. And if you start building up that stack, you force fights in a meta where everyone's picking Disengage. Everyone's picking Gragas and Lulu. If you have three Dragons and all the Disengage, suddenly the fifth Dragon's a very real win condition. Yeah, you just get to dictate so much with all of that control. That's what the power of Disengage gives you it's not necessarily the ability to start fights with your hard engage or really you know dictate with some super strong assassins and take people out it's just to be like i want to fight here or i don't want to fight here and get to say exactly when that gets to happen exactly you choose the time for your engages although there was definitely an argument for assassin play from the likes of aria in our previous game graves as well still going to be respected as a potential pick coming through in the ad carry role i mean coming on to someone like radio is probably the most well known of the oceanic players does play a bit of the callista but if we do see callista a certain counter pick definitely coming through from the brazilian side as they've been playing a lot to Tristana and especially their final series. Yeah, I mean, it, obviously if we see more, we'll get a bit more details, but we are seeing people start to pick on Callista. Urgot was the big pick that came through that started to punish her. So 5.7, again, a bit more changes, a bit more adaptation. All of a sudden, Brazilians are playing uh, 
Tristana and loving it so far on the bottom side. The champion pools for these teams definitely hitting up there over the hundreds, you'd have to say. Basically, every champion being considered in different roles. And, I mean, we've already seen a support Gragas. So there's always a lot of flexibility coming through in the picks. In terms of contested picks, Gragas, we already saw locked in. Gragas, Hecarim. I cannot see the Chiefs picking up both Gragas and Hecarim against Liga Ents because Gragas, Hecarim, and Lulu up there with the most contested picks in the league. Gragas, to me, is the big one there as well. Actually, for both sides, I imagine it's not a revolta style champion but he probably has that in his pocket as well if he does want to bring it out so he's the big one he's been for me one of the strongest looking picks on the recent patch as well so many teams putting massively high priority on it so we'll have to see and if we start seeing jungle bands which is likely honestly given the caliber of the two junglers that are facing off all of a sudden the pool just gets opened up for everyone else and the jungle bands it's not always the champions you might expect the likes of Sejuani can fall through if we're talking about mid game centric junglers if you start banning out the likes of Gragas and Rek'Sai you can't always fit in another jungle band so there is the potential that a champion like Sejuani will come Come out. And if Spooks has shown anything, it's that he has ideas against the Sejuani in the OPL at least. Likes either Zach if they're going for a control engage lineup, so Zach Oriana, they've brought back as kind of a synergy, a team fight synergy coming through from the Chiefs, or just go full early game with the Elise. Yeah, that's I guess our questions. How are these teams gonna play? How aggressive do they want to be? And we'll start answering some of those questions as we hop into our drafts. Chiefs versus Ints here, and Azir is the Chiefs' first ban. I mean Zia, the control mage, has shown so much play, and again. Disengage is the word you'd use, especially for that Emperor's Divide. Azir going backwards is so much stronger than Azir going forwards. And that's a champion who can still make crazy plays with his kit and the likes of Emperor's, in Emperor's Divide as an engage tool. But Disengage, setting up a couple of soldiers, pushing people either into the damage or away from your threats. Azir with Hyper Carries, one of the strongest strategies at this present yeah, point. Have a bit of a smile there at the Scion Bang, which Swiper has seen aimed at him so many times in the OPL. Gonna get it again here at Wildcard, but Rex is their second man. Jana uh, away from Rosie, so will be in second. And again, both teams similar have done their homework, the Brazilians especially. Absolutely, these are very high win rate champions, I believe. Rosie only one defeat during the OPL season on the Jana. Definitely a priority champion for him, even though he used to have an identity as an engaged support. Love the likes of Annie and then Zyra as, uh, as some of his mage champions, building AP on them wherever he could fit into his build. Been reinvented in 2015 as a disengaged support. Speaking of disengage and control junglers, the Nunu, another champion that might have been contested. The Chiefs actually looking to ban it on the blue side. Yeah, I mean, so don't want to take it here. They ban the Rek'Sai as well, so clearly respecting Revolta. Maokai, the last ban, they're going to take away another tank from Swiper, but we've seen his Hecarim already today. Do the Chiefs dare to first pick it again? And they do. I think you have to. There's so many flexible options. You can throw the Smite on, look for the lane, so you can throw the Ignite, look for 2v2 wow. lanes. It's actually the Callista taken by Ints in this game. And when you take the Hecarim, you give up the Gragas. Love the blocker picks here from Ints. Callista and Gragas taken away as their first two picks. And they were confident lock-ins. Absolutely. And those are the strongest champions available at this point in the draft, you have to think. Sejuani's not a big priority pick for Spooks. So they didn't look to lock that away, despite, of course, its popularity on 5.6 into 5.7. Disengage for a hyper carry like Callista, specifically with a huge two-item team fighting spike is already shapes to be a powerful draft from it. Yeah, and Chief's going to slow things down. Had a very first big hacker room, and it was answered by inst almost Instalocks there for their first few champions. Again, we talked about the Callista on the Chief's side with some counter picks available, but not the same picks necessarily available for the Chiefs. I mean, that, you can see there's already a lot of indecision. 10 seconds with no lock-in. So confident with their locks-in of the likes of Hecarim in the previous draft. They're going to return, though, to the Hecarim uh, Siva synergy. They're on the hunt finding so many different tools for for Swiper on this Hecarim. Swiper definitely gone from the utility tank. You can see the Scion ban. It was all about Scion and Maokai early in the season, but this is his new identity. This is the renaissance of the carry Swiper, famous for his top lane Trindamir. Hecarim's Maybe a reliable tank, but the burst damage is what separates him from the likes of Sion and Maokai. So they're really setting up once again the Hecarim to carry, and it looked like a pretty damn good strategy in game one. Yeah, we'll have to see again. Early game, potentially a struggle there for the Oceanic side, but that's Sivir Morgana, their, first, their next few picks, sorry. So again, making sure they can power up some of their carries, hiding the jungle and mid picks, it seems like, here as well. But Ints, now going to see what they want to take away. We're possibly looking to get the Morgana Callista going to be able to protect the short range but very powerful hyper carry on Callista. And this is actually a pick we didn't talk about as they hover it. 
It is locked in. Yang's Nara is insane, and the cannon's going to get locked in as well. Yang in game two of that series against Key, that final a few days ago, went off on this Nara. Specifically, one moment around a Baron fight, a four-man Nara. Actually, a five-man Nara, but four-man stun against a wall near Baron Pit into the fifth member, Shivana, being displaced as well. It was one of the big factors in winning the games. Played it twice in that series. Look at all this CC. Callista Cannon actually is the duo coming through. So they have flexible engage and disengage options. I mean, you throw out the explosive cask and then just activate the slicing maelstrom next to the Callista, and she'll be hopping mad around a team fight, and there's little to nothing you can do. Yeah, and we've talked about so many different Callista based lands, but Callista Cannon might be the best one currently as the Chiefs. They take Sedwani there for Spooks, but Swiffer gets his LeBlanc. And look, Swiffer's LeBlanc bought him so many MVP votes during the OPL season. But to be honest, he, they needed to pick the LeBlanc blind in this case because they needed something to show a bit of presence in mid. They've got a farming jungler. They've got a farming top laner. They're not looking necessarily for lane strength at this point. Silver's been largely found out in terms of 2v2 laning. We'll do fine against the Callista, but it's not certainly an ideal matchup. They need LeBlanc to be so respected this game that it will force Ince to really react around mid lane and distract the fact that they want the Hecarim and the Sejuani to farm up. It's thinking of a lot of different identities when it came to either punishing the LeBlanc or looking for a uh, split farming option. They considered the Twisted Fate, which would have been definitely not the cleanest 1v1 lane matchup. Definitely a lot of downside potential. But look like they're going for a much safer option. In fact, it'll be the reverse of the matchup, I believe, from game one. Yeah, I mean, we've seen this already today. Oriana looked just fine into the LeBlanc, and that is the lock-in there for Ince as their final pick over to Tokers. So, again, the Chiefs I kind of looked down the line. The first thing I see is this top lane matchup and thinking, with that smite especially, Swiper wants to get the hell out of that 1v1. I mean, lane swap will definitely be the story of the day when it comes to the Hecarim. Can exit lane so happily. The jungle follows obviously blazingly fast when you have the double smite coming through from Sejuani and Hecarim. And the double smite, one thing we say about Sejuani jungle can fall dangerously low on her first clear. But when we're talking about double smite, her fast jungling pace belies the fact that she falls low. So if you're just able to use the smite, can actually stay topped up. And the two feet, the, 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 the jungle follower when it comes to ganking is actually quite good when it, the Arctic Assault can hit into maybe the devastating charge. The burst damage can be relevant. And you have to think they're going to be completely trained onto mid lane to get Swift for snowballing in this game. Yeah, interesting to see Spooks on a champion like Sejuani, honestly, was known in the regular season in the playoffs for punishing that champion with the likes of Elise and even the likes of Gragas. Going to go into a slightly unfavorable jungle matchup, I have to think. And that's the thing we have to look for here. Sejuani's uh, level 6 pressure versus all the pressure all the time from Revolta's Gragas. It's just a very interesting matchup coming through, specifically from Ints. So much teamfight damage from the Callista, some burst from Orianna, but not a lot of other damage threats. And it's this Hecarim versus Callista paradox almost. Can the Hecarim get enough items? Again, the part time we've been seeing is the challenging smite Cinderhawk into the Trinity Force, into the Home Guard boats to try and burst down this Callista basically in one fell swoop because there's disengage a plenty coming through from the Ince lineup. But if the Hecarim can't get to the Callista, there's so much peel for her that the Ren set potential is massive. It's through the roof here for Ince. And it's the same looking sort of composition for Chiefs as we saw earlier. If they fall behind the early game, they have shown they can pick themselves up and carry them into mid and late game situations. And they've got a good comp to do that. But Ince are a scary team. In their early game, if they really turn on the aggression, if the, uh, the Oceanic side will fall behind and maybe never be able to catch back up. And that's the thing. Punish the Sejuani and Hecarim duo. They're trying to dodge lane as much as possible. I expect Fireworks at level one to try and make this Hecarim accountable and make this Sejuani predictable. Because if they ever get in their face, there's not much a Sejuani can do in the early levels. Well, let's have a look now as both teams look to be heavily stacked together in the early stages of the level one. Oceani is the Chiefs versus the Brazilian side Ints. Going to be a tough one here for both sides. You have to think some good-looking teams on both sides moving through. And honestly, I look down the lineups and it seems like both teams have got comfort. The Chiefs certainly haven't learned much from the first game. Still looking for the five-man invade. Yang hasn't put down his ward yet. I hope he doesn't get too frisky because it could be real painful. Yeah, the Chiefs move out though. Yang not going to get first blooded there. That was actually what happened to the Chiefs in the last game. To their top lane, a swiper actually, so Yang will not revisit that situation. But again, just getting the wards done. Ints will move down and respond with some trinkets of their own. And again, it's all about early vision, looking for that lane swap. So didn't talk much about the support cannon pickups. It's been seeing popularity. The likes of Zero from Starhorn Royal Club really loving that champion. A lot of lane presence. Callista 
surprisingly good at level one, depending on what spell you you pick up, whether it's the Pierce, whether it's the Rent, sometimes even the Sentinel, if you're looking to pick up the likes of the Gromp. Callista can be that powerful level one champion. And when you're talking about Callista Cannon, Cannon has so much lane presence. Okay, it's not top lane Cannon with 575 range like years past, but still very strong, can pick up that Shuriken, no resource, which is a unique factor as a support champion. But so far, it looks like the, the lane swap has been successful from the Chiefs. Although Rosie, not sure if it was spot out. I don't actually think so. It's so clever. They were actually moving to the top lane and he showed himself and they instantly started going the other way. Unfortunately for the Chiefs, Ince figured it out and they're going to go back to the top side. But that was a very clever attempt at almost tricking them into swapping. Yeah, they sussed them out in this section. They will make the the Hecarim accountable. He started the jungle follow. He's definitely going to pick up a couple of camps because if you pick up the smite, instead of just starting with, say, the flask and picking up one camp, you can confidently pick up a second camp. But he's already actually spent his gold on potions, so it won't be a massive pickup, even if he picks up two camps. Yeah, and you'll see we'll actually have a 2v2 on the top side. So Inzi have to think, get the lanes they want here. Swiper is taking away a camp. We'll take the wolves, but soon enough, he's going to have to go down to the bottom side of the map. And look, he can't pick up the cloth armor that he might have been able to purchase if he hadn't on for the potions. He was basically all in once he picked up the potions that they get the lane stop. So credit to Ince. It was a very it was a head scratcher. It was Sherlock Holmes kind of insight required, but they guessed top and they guessed right. Yeah, they did indeed. So swap initiated by the Chiefs was spotted out by Ince and we're going to isolate this mid lane here. That might favor Swiffer in the early stages of the landing phase, but we've already seen the matchup once today. Oriana, once she gets a couple levels, just looks so comfortable against the Assassin. The resulting lane matchup between the Nar and the Hecarim is definitely not a happy time for Hecarim. Just going to take the ranged auto attacks. Go on for Doran Blade. So extra laning stats here for Nar. Might even see the visit from Gragas relatively early in this game because there is always kill pressure on a no escape top laner. And you can see there as well as we do see Mick Mick a Brizzle, I believe that is, watching there with some pizza shapes. Very recommended snack there as well. That's the perfect snack for this time of night. Absolutely. It really is. It really is strong stuff here. So nice to see that we probably have some Oceanic viewers up late to watch this match here as well. And again, an important one for both sides. So not super surprising as again, Civil will be just fine in the 2v2 for now. Here looks even on CS between them. But that cannon, once he gets going, can look so aggressive. And level 6 especially is a scary time. Awkward spell shield coming through. Actually did not pick up the mana restore. Now not available. And you'll start to see the lane presence of the Ken and Callista lane in particular. Even with Dark Binding registering, you can see Radia really respects the, the trade damage. Just, it's so hard to win damage trades against a champion who has high bases like the Cannon, let alone the Callista. She gets a couple of runs in. You're stunned up through that passive, the electrical surge from the Cannon. You're just not enjoying your time against the Mark of the Storm. No, really not. And I think in some ways, uh, it is some aggressive lanes from Ince versus the more defensive lanes for Chiefs. And that's not to say that the teams necessarily get grossly outscaled on one side or the other. But certainly as far as early lane pressure and advantage goes, I think that is here for Ince. And you can tell, again, Revolta fishing for a very early gank in the mid lane. So if it's actually surprisingly reserved, he usually is happy to push in and court uh, controversy in the mid lane. Just because, again, Spooks usually has... Uh, his eyes trained upon this mid lane matchup, but was very reserved. Actually sat back in this lane, like, even against the likes of Oriana. Looks to be trying to create a zone, knowing that in the terms of the 2v2, not really looking to opt into that with the Sejuani until it's closer to level 6. And the zone's working well so far. Almost 10 CS ahead has rated. Good spell shield on the pierce there. Those trades, though. Yeah, I mean, this is Kalista. This is part of the reason she's such a strong and popular AD carry pick. Once the trade starts, there are very few AD carries that can answer you. Sejuani understands the situation. He's looking Looking for the lane gank, Radius still quite a long time on that spell should such a long cooldown at level one. And it's deceptive to know when to use it against the likes of Cannon, who's auto attack, who's, you know, the Shuriken toss. There's many different options for Cannon to try and prompt the stun. And that's first one registers. Oh, Rady uses it again there, actually. Going to take a bit of harass as a result. Spooks, sticky around, maybe trying to bait them in here, but pretty healthy other dual lane from Ince here, so not going to bite it off quite yet, and pretty hard to pin someone down. It's still 3v2 on the top side. Jungler firmly in the bottom there for Ince, and Chiefs are waiting patiently for this gank. They're really looking for, for Kennen to step away from the minion life so they can hit the 
the Dark Bunny. They preferably, of course, want to hit it onto the Callista, but this is so much patience from Spooks Sent to spot it out. Sentinel does spot them. The Q comes in, but it will miss their binding going wide there as well. And Sejuani waits, but that's a misfire. What a prediction coming through. There was, I mean, it was such a long bluff. I thought for sure the Callista would just see it, but it's one of those cases where you can throw out the Sentinel. There's such a low mana cost that why not just check the brush? It's always the big conundrum, but such safe to do it from range and doesn't get punished. Really has to be careful. Good binding from Rosie keeps him safe as the bind goes through as well. Rosie with the ignite actually might chase him for the kill. Jocks are going to get low, but will not fall down. It was an auto attack, maybe two auto attacks away from death, but is able to stay in lane. Has some potions to pop, and the Callista not being punished just yet. But finally, a little bit of breathing room for the duo here from the Oceanic representative. So they'll push the lane and probably go back, but a good answer there from Revolta. Takes the early dragon and Swiffer gonna try and chase him down, but he's already over the top. Swiffer, keep gonna go in, gonna try and find the chain onto Yang. Does grab it, but can't keep going. Honestly, just using his mana pool there, wasn't gonna be able to instantly DPS down the tanky Nut in Meganar form of all things. This has bought time for Hecarim to farm, especially in a 1v1 matchup with Smite, and it's been forced to stay accountable in a 1v1 matchup with no jungle pressure. Keeping even is actually very good for Swiper, but they eat the dragon uh, through from Ints just because they spent just too much time in the top lane. So punished for that rotation with Spooks. An aggressive war there by Tokens put down as well, roaming pretty deep into the enemy jungle on the blue side just to get it down. But that's a great bit of information we'll spot Sejuani moving up that side towards the lane or even just towards the wolf camp. But the warding in general is wonderful. Even though it's an early in the game, we don't see sight stones being completed just yet. Aggressive wards onto both the red buff and the blue buff area from the Chiefs just makes Sejuani that much more predictable. It means that when level six is pinged, the first gank, if it's predictable, and which Spooks is level six at this point, any extra information so you can respect the massive initiation potential of the Glacial Prison will be invaluable. And with that aggressive vision, they pick up the enemy blue Lovely as well. Lovely steal there from Ince as well. We'll give that away to Tokers, and that's going to make a matchup that's starting to get a bit trickier for the LeBlanc, despite the CS lead that Swiffer currently has. Athens plus the blue buff as Swiffer goes in for what looks like a Morella Nomicon for a bit more aggression. All of a sudden, Oriana just almost untouchable now in the mid lane. And look, high level League of Legends can sometimes feel like a chess game, but the first piece, the first move was made, just getting that e e that aggressive vision in to make the Sejuani predictable, but it also opened up the steal and spooks. Oh, does dodge the ultimate there if I talk as good Arctic is sold out, sort of Predicts the shockwave to come in and just cues our way. Didn't even need to use the flash. So Ince went for the engage. Couldn't get it. Now the shockwave's on cooldown. Now you really don't want to overextend if you're the Orianna. Just wants to push in this wave as much as possible. But Swiffer probably going to use his health bar to stop this from hitting turret. And just trying to create as many zones as possible in mid. It's only bought him a 10 CS advantage. But purely, this is from smart laning by Swiffer. And all of the smart lanings actually bought Chiefs a 700 gold lead or 600 gold lead in the early stages. Pretty much purely just from fire. All right, Ints do have a dragon, so there's an advantage there to bounce it out as well. But we talked about the comps and the Chiefs wanting to scale a bit more. Fates Call, though, going to get used in Raided with a wonderful spell shield. Still gets stunned, though. Cannon as he gets nailed. And now the Pierce comes through as Rosie looking to go in there. Tries to move them out of the way. Great boomerang blade there for the trade. But Rosie now in trouble. Gets chased down. But Swiffer gets first blood solo in the mid lane. Nope, Spooks was there to help him. Yeah, Spooks was there. You can see the Glacial Prison's on cooldown. So that's the big engage kill coming through from the Spooks and Swiffer. A duo that have been together for so long on multiple top competitive lineups. They get the Oriana. They get the Oriana quite confidently. Look at this. They're so aggressive under turret, but they understand their damage output perfectly. Swiffer takes him down. The control mage was getting through the lane. Macau, out. that was a mistake. Uses the heal. Goes down to Rosie. Backing in an awkward spot as Jockster comes in. But Radia takes the free mana and cannon. He can't go in. A good flash from Radia as Revolta is coming as well. But he eats a binding. Teleport coming through for Swiper. Ulti moves in there for the onslaught of Chatters. Revolta will go down to Radia. Jockster can't get the trade kill. Getting chased down now as well. Radia gonna get low, has to dodge out. We'll go down to the cannon, but cannon will fall as well. And Swiper gets that one. The summoner spell usage was the big highlight there. The early heal to get through the sustain. And then the flash was majestic to stop the explosive cast when pushing him towards the cannon. And then the teleport. Remember, Yang actually has teleport available and uh, did not elect to use it. And the big kill came through for the Hecarim. And we, I talked about it a little bit. The laning phase being slow, paid, slow played somewhat by the Chiefs. 
due to the scaling and the timing they need to wait for big ultimates to come through. But all of a sudden, it explodes across the rift here. 4-1 now up for the Chiefs, and that dragon's coming back in just under two minutes. And I feel like some of the confidence there is we're going to see the replay. Watch this flash. It's beautiful. I only I believe the damage does register, but the re-engage, the teleport comes through early. Nah has the option to come in doesn't take it. Radio falls low, but this is a support cannon. Don't have to respect, especially the slicing maelstrom damage a lot. The last auto attack awkwardly does take out Radio, but if you're going to pass the kill credit to anyone in this lineup, there's only one really strong late game champion on the Chiefs, and that's Hecarim. It is the Hecarim here as Swiffer gets a bit of damage done onto the pink ward. Now has the blue buff there as well. He's going to come back here as Spooks is actually waiting, hoping to bait someone in. Wonderful LeBlanc mechanics clears out the wards, and again, the next big pressure point is this dragon up in a minute 10. So the solo kill and 15 CS is the advantage. Mid wants to keep zoning out the Orianna because there will be that late game item timing, specifically the Athenes into the death cap where Orianna will be able to do so much shooting for particularly the Callista. The Callista herself was punished for her back timing, but CS wise is doing very well. Building for the Bloodthirster. Gets a solo kill again with the help of Spooks. I gotta stop calling it a solo killer. Swiffer gonna go back in. Swiper looking for it. No ulti. We just bumps Yang into the wall, but Megana is gonna come through. They'll back away as a result. And Spooks lives on a sliver of health and another kill onto Ori. We said it so many times during the OPL season about Swiffer and Spooks synergy. Jockster ults. Bates call in there. Raid. It does have the black shield on him, but the stuns will come through. Second stun moving in as Rosie tries to find it, but Macau does get the kill there as Callista's picking up. Kills is but what I meant. Rosie and Radia just obviously not on the same wavelength. Rosie walked out the exact opposite way, didn't walk with the carry, no black shield to pass on to Siva, and just falls down for free in that engage. So I have to wonder about the communication between the very practice bottom lane. Yeah, I think so as well. A swiper pushing now on the top side as well. Ninja Tawai plus the Cinderhawk already completed with the Skirmisher's Saber firmly in the inventory. Tower looking to go down here. Dragon is back alive and Ints are positioned on top of it. Sorry to correct you, but actually went for the Ninja Tabby early, so it doesn't have the Cinder Hulk yet. Working towards the item has the Skirmisher's Saber completed, but not quite the big power spike coming through. There is the Skirmisher's Saber that still makes him very happy at diving onto enemy carries. Yep, looking good so far, but Ints again on top of their second dragon. The Chiefs might look to fight as Rosie and Spooks are in the area, but just a couple of Ren stacks coming in. It's going to be a very tricky steal, and if the Chiefs can't have an outright fight, they're probably not going to go for it, and Ints do get their second dragon. So first, now second dragon goes through to Ints. They need to really make them accountable for this third dragon that they have an exact timer for in six minutes' time. By then, Hecra might be really building towards this item, now does have the Cinder Hulk you mentioned, will be close to at least the Phage or Sheen, but definitely not the Trinity Force by the time the next dragon comes. They really need to comp around it though, as we've already seen. You move towards that third dragon, suddenly the game just gets that much more difficult because you have so many extra factors to consider if you're the Chiefs. Yeah, so a 3,000 gold lead plus a turret up there for the Chiefs versus the two dragons of Ints. Again, that dragon certainly pays off in the later stages of the game because it doesn't give you gold, just the stacking buff. So we'll see what happens in the next five to six minutes or so. But right now, Swiper just holding the wave under his turret because Swiffer is rejoining back in the top, but Yang is already backed off. Yeah, it just has to back away. There's no reason to be overextended now that Swiffer's not uh, being seen on the map. As Orion, there's two good pink wards in the area combined to just the one a fairly defensive pink ward coming through from Oriana, but still not able to get any kill credit. For, for the jungle matchup that we actually featured earlier in the game, Revolt is certainly not making lanes pay, but has answered all the aggression from the Chiefs with this dragon stacking. So it'll be interesting to see if that's enough because the lanes for Chiefs, they're winning. It's a 3,400 gold lead. That's really big for 14 minutes. Yeah, Swiffer especially putting up a nice performance so far on the LeBlanc. Currently up 2-0. Goes back and gets a needlessly large rod. So going to look to turn on more aggression. Rosie has to be careful though. And again, the Cannon Callista that we talked about, it, it is deadly. It is deadly. And you can see Radio has to respect the damage potential coming through. The CC as well. He's already been caught out a few times preemptively spell shielding. The moment that, sp that spell shield is used, he basically has to seed lane. He has to exit lane until he has it available again. So he just basically is really picking his engages carefully. Good bind lands there. Spooks is here as well. Knockup moves in, but the Fates Call is going to come in. Spooks lines up the ult. He hits onto Macau. Ready going to dive in as Joxa defensively ults. The Boomerang Blade almost enough from Sivir, but Callista lives on a sliver of health. On a sliver of health, but neither member is healthy enough to help fight for this turret. So taking down the turret, maybe that will be the first step towards securing this third, dra this third dragon, which will spawn soon. Their first dragon, of course. Revolta 
pays attention to top, but with the Onslaught of Shadows available, still very safe, the Hecarim. Yes, Wiper just pops his E and runs back down the lane. Two zero now up in turrets for Chiefs, and starting to mount up towards that mid-game snowball that we talked about. This is how they like to play. They've had much slower early games in general, I have to say, going kind of falling back away from what was once a very aggressive lineup, but their mid-game presence is always the same. Get your deep wards down, start taking turrets, and take over the map. And it's much like the Bangkok Titans in the previous game, of course. They have the mid game lineup that's signified by the LeBlanc in mid lane. You look down this lineup, you think of a balanced 5v5 in the late game. How is LeBlanc realistically going to get through all the disengage and CC that's put on by Int? You can see a point where LeBlanc becomes less team fight relevant. So the only way to make her relevant in the mid to late game is get award supremacy, force fights on your own terms, get picks. And the only way to do that is to really clamp down on vision. It's why you see a lot of pink wards towards the dragon. But those pink wards are only relevant if they can actually use them to force this next dragon or get some picks around it. Otherwise, they're just standing gold for what will be eventually a very strong late game for Ents. And it bridges the Hecarim so nicely as well. Swiper building up towards his next major item, whether that's tankiness, whether that's the Trinity Force that he wants to pick up, we'll have to see. But Raider has gone back. He's picked up his Infinity Edge. Macau still working on the Bloodthirster, but will be there soon as Revolta pops down to the bottom lane and three men strongly take the bottom turret. They take their first outer turret of this game. The item timing still waiting for on Ents. Given that they really rely on the Clister for early game damage, the Hurricane is going to be the big power spike, you'd have to think. The Bloodthirster for laning is completed at this point, so we'll still be very strong in the 1v1 matchup against the Sivir, but it's only when the attack speed item is completed that's a really big call. And that's the second time it's happened to me today. A Swiper in the top side, actually. We'll run away there from Yang, who's looking aggressive, going for that Sunfire Cape, actually, that I believe is quite well known for with the Chain Vest and the Barmy Cinder already in there. But as we do see again, easy as jeans. There. That is so many screens, but I love it. Looking at Runes of Mastery, he's watching the game. Everything's going well. I mentioned Affluent with previous screens, but there's so many people with so many screens, so many options. And it's just good to see. It's great to see here. And uh, the thing I want to mention again, the Sunfire Camp now picked up for Yang, but going to move back over to the other side to the mid lane for a second. It's not a Zonia's once again. They keep tricking me, Papa Smithy. It's a Luden's Echo second. It's not quite Deathfire Grass that LeBlanc players might have opted into in previous patches, but it's just more burst. And you get so many spell rotations with your short cooldowns with the likes of Mimic. That again, two spell rotations. That's 200 base damage, plus, of course, AP scaling coming through from the Luden's Echo. More burst. That's happy times for the LeBlanc. You saw Chiefs group up in the mid there, trying to take the last outer turret, but Ints are grouping well there to make sure that doesn't happen. Swiper smites the Gromp and takes it away. He's got a Phage now, so I have to think the Trinity Force is the next purchase on his mind, and that's the big hit there for the Hecarim. Whatever two items he wants, whenever he hits them, he usually starts to really impact the team fights. So has the Phage for the next Dragon Fight. It's been on lockdown by Ints so far, but those are now completed by the Callista. Again, it's easy to punish this Swiffer item build. He hasn't gone for a thing. He's gone for the cheaper Merlin Nomicon option. He's also gone for the Luden's Echo. There's no semblance of magic resist in this discussion pastry time. So the big thing for Ints around this third dragon, which it looks like with all the pink wars that Chaser put down, they're looking to opt into a fight around, is try and make Swiffer pay for all his aggression he's shown in the first 19 minutes. Well, they do need to fight here, but Ints are getting back on top of it, starting to clear out some of the other vision, putting down their own pink wards, and it's back in 10 seconds. Radiant with no tower might have to dodge a gank here, but a good ward will spot them off here, and the blood those are done for Callista means that Radiant probably doesn't fancy that 1v1. I'd like to see Hecarim walk down to help with the ward clean just because they've already spent two, 300 gold around on pinks around this area. And obviously, if you have less members, you just seed any hope of keeping those pink wards on the map. You can see the big contest is being expected. Hecarim's backing maybe to look for those home guards for the potential flank engage. Inst they've had the lockdown on Dragons, the big win condition they've opened up in their early play. Gold-wise, they're a few thousand gold behind, but Callista gets going in a fight that's going to all be equalized. The home guards are here and Swiper is waiting back in the base so the Chiefs have to pull the trigger now and most importantly they have to get on the dragon soon because if Ints get on top of it and the Ren stacks up they have no hope of contesting it. The minion waves for Ints are really well prepped. They look in the bottom and top lane both have big winning waves being pushed. Chiefs have to start now and the big teleport that'll be the question. Yeah, here it comes they're moving in. Spooks diving in aggressively but Drockstar ends up with his ulti. Swiper diving in the back line looking for Macau but gets stunned up but Swiffer has gotten the first kill. Swiper ulti 
Rosie's there and he's going to chase out the Callista. Rosie pops the ulti. They're chasing so hard and they do get it. But Yang going to hop in on the nut. Almost in the Mega Nut form now as well. But we're still fighting on the other side of Swiper. Getting low there. They have to take out Tokens. Gragas goes down, but Swiffer looks to fall as well. Doesn't quite go down, but it's a win. Actually, no. A trade. I say it wrong. Three for three on both sides. Three for three, but no dragon being claimed by the Chiefs. Still hope for Inst to pick that objective up. Get a lot of assists and gold onto Tokas. Getting, of course, the assists. Oriana in general and every team fight is going to shield up, going to pop the distance, get a lot of kill credit. So an even trade despite the gold lead is a good thing for him. It really is here in a strong team fight. They couldn't quite position both their carries, could the Chiefs. And again, it's so awkward to have to force on top of the Dragon, but that's the choice they have to make now, given that they're already down by two. And that fight, LeBlanc, expertly navigated around and got some kills. So we'll see the replay coming through. Wait for the ball placement. There's actually a really big shockwave coming out in the middle of this fight, waiting for the engage. On the three members, I believe, was the shockwave. Um, Macau found a really good spot to auto attack, but then it was just punished by Swiffer because he started to kite backwards towards the bottom of the map. The fight continued at this point. It will eventually be the even trade. Swiffer even gets a second Luden's Echo proc. They thought they got the kill, but it was, of course, the, the clone in that situation. They rush straight back to the dragon, but some of the big ultimates are not available. Rosie's got a pick, though, and Swiffer takes it out. Now Spook's going to dive in onto Revolta. Rosie will clear the pink waters. Yang going to look in, but he's got no rage so far, and the Chiefs on top of the dragon do take it away. Way. And when you have Ward Supremacy, you see the power of LeBlanc. One of the big things to consider, her ult so frequently available when you go for that CDR build. Everyone on Ince was waiting for those ults. Now finally up, but doesn't matter. The objective is taken by Chiefs. Yeah, and this LeBlanc is massive. 5-0-1 for Swiffer right now. Luden, Zeko, and Merlinomicon, and an EDC large rod. The tower will fall, giving Chiefs a bit more gold. As Revolts are going to get dove on. Massive damage there from LeBlanc. As Spooks goes in, finds the ulti onto Togger Swiper. Going to dive in there as well. The Shockwave, though, going to take out Spooks. As Yang hops away, but Swiffer wants more blood, dives in again, looking for a kill, but can't find either of the blinking low members of Ince. And the real staggered engages coming through from Chiefs. Aggression isolated, but Swiffer. So deep they're going in, but out of mana, I think, is the only reason he didn't chase in. And this LeBlanc is really hungry to pump up the KDA. And you can see that Swiffer and Spooks really want to dive in, but the other objectives were staggered. They were not of one mind, and the result was just a trade kill coming through with what could have been a bigger team fight win for Chiefs. They need to expand on these things as Yang <laughs> Swiss dies. Finds a way to the top lane and just gets another kill. That's six now for the LeBlanc. And again, we've seen it. We've seen one LeBlanc already. Just not amount to anything at this stage. But when you're this far ahead on LeBlanc, you can still snowball in a mid game. And the mimics are just coming off cooldown so quickly. And the burst of rotations with the Loon's Echo. And now another needlessly large rod. No time for Sorcerer's Shoes but no time for any members on Ince to react. They just die in one rotation. And again, Ince have to be careful, but they are getting some items powering up now as well. Randu and Zoman almost complete for Yang and does have the Sunfire plus the Ninja Tab I done. Two items now done for Tokas at a very strong pace and as even the CS back up in that lane nicely. So the Death Cap and the Athenes are looking good. The Bloodthirsted on for Macau might be the biggest thing, but he is going back to shop and does almost have enough for the Hurricane. But crucially, the Hurricane's going to come in pretty late. It's looking like a 26 27 minute hurricane. The two item power spike will start to get outscaled when armor is purchased. Hecarim's already fit in some cost effective armor, so not rushing purely for the Trinity Force. Might feel that he already has a burst friend in Swiffer that Yay. doesn't necessarily need. Yeah, almost goes down. That's the tanky now with no MR, but a good stack of health getting chunked out massively by the LeBlanc. And he sits with his inventory there. He's not interested in any sort of defensive item. He's going for a death cap third. That's why I quite like the fact that they're not rushing the Trinity Force. Get a bit of armor. Stop the potential for the Ren set. Good ulti there coming through under Swiffer, but a great ulti there. Answer by Spooks. The Fates go popped in. They're going to try and throw Cannon through, but the Chiefs will disengage. But trading a couple of ults for this outer turret staying up is a good trade for Ince. They're still scaling up to late. They're so preciously close, perilously close even to the big Hurricane purchase coming through from the Callista to really make them up into fights. Oh, Macau eats a binding though, and the damage does come through. Yang down the bottom getting pressure, but Swiffer gets melt, but he wants to dive, goes in on top, doesn't quite get it, and has to back away from Joxter, who just misses that shuriken crucially as Tokens dodges the binding. Spooks in trouble. Macau looking for a reset. Swiver gets exhausted, goes in. Luton's echo damage comes to his radiant, takes it out as the chain just procs there and Swiper even wrapping around the top side, proxying now in the bottom. So Chiefs have a lot of turret damage, but very poor siege. Of course, only 500 range against the multiple initiation tools. We've already seen 
two fights where oh. Swoifer going in, wants another kill. Macau will live for now, but Raydig flashing forward, looks for it. One auto comes in, needs one more. Fleet of Foot comes up good, and Raydig gets the kill. Yeah, the passive comes up big, just overconfident farming, you have to say, from Macau. Didn't need to die in that situation, but they're really struggling to take these objectives. The outer turret already seems like a massive journey for the Chiefs to pick up. The inhibitor turret's going to be even harder, and honestly, they don't have the Gragas that they had in game one to push people off turrets. All they really have as an option is to get picks, and that's why Swiffer being so massive is so relevant. Yeah, and wonderful side wave control there as well, I have to say, from Ince. They've done such a good job of pushing in the top side especially, and that's honestly part of the reason that they're having issues. But Logitech, they're the sponsor, of course, of the Chiefs. That is a pretty ball away to watch this game. Absolutely. That's a massive screen coming through. So don't have quite as many screens as some of our friends, that's, but certainly that's like, a huge one. That's like 15 screens, by the way, to make up that one screen. So that is a lot of screens, Bubba Smithy. So what we're trying to see is someone to up the game even further than Logitech. That's the gambit we throw Can out. Can you get more than 15 screens? Well, we'll have to see, guys. If you can, get out on Twitter and use the hashtag IWC. I would love to see 20-plus screens watching this game as well. It's been a great game so far. The Chiefs do have a nice lead right now, but Ints are fighting back well. But they're finding minion waves on priority, people. Look at the Hecarim bot hoovering down a massive wave. Item build, about 1,200 gold away from the Trinity Force. Already has the cost-effective armor coming through. Kalista perilously close with, I've said that a couple of times, but now the extra dagger, so, so close. Just basically overextending to far for farm to get that last 200 gold, but not been able to find it as Chiefs, they take away the red. Yeah, 4,000 gold ahead still there for the Chiefs, so not a massive lead to be honest, but they've converted well for a lot of objectives. I guess need to keep the snowball going, have to certainly press the advantage because it's not an unassailable lead yet. I mean, it's a massive late game scaling comp, but the consistent damage is all about Macau and the Callista, and the Callista even though her score is just fine and CS is competitive with Siva, is hitting those item timings really, really late. So you worry. Now the armor is completed on both the frontline members of the Chiefs. Maybe the Ren sets won't be relevant, but this is the big power spike. Bloodthirster into Hurricane finally completed at 27 minutes for the Callista. Yeah, Oriana looking strong as well, almost with a Void Staff now to match the three items there coming through for LeBlanc, but a locket done now. For Spooks as well. Giant spelt there for a Volta who's looking quite tanky actually with his build right now, but not quite you looking think that's tanky. Look at Morgana, a sneaky righteous glory. It's not quite the Q the Zonyas, but still another team fight initiation option for the Chiefs. Dragons back in now as well, and Ints do want to fight for it. Swiffer sort of getting flanked here, but Spooks dives in. Swiffer again aggressively zoning out the carries here, and Chiefs claim vision, they're gonna get straight on top of the dragon. Swiffer's happy to be in vision, he just wants to get a pick. That was a lot of damage. Yeah, but they're on the dragon at this point. That's the big thing. They don't. They have a smite on it, of course. Hecarim has smite, so they're happy to show multiple members, and you have to respect the burst That's damage. very clever there as Swiffer does dive back in. The second dragon will now go to the Chiefs, the fourth overall in this game. As Spooks trying to line up an ultimate, but can't find it yet. And the only thing for the Chiefs right now is they've gotten good control of the neutral of the map. The dragons are going down. They're looking strong, but just get these sideways pushing because Ints have done such a good job of keeping them away. And that's been the best indicator of why Ints are respect as a top level team. They're very smart at their side wave control. That's the one thing that's been in their control, because to be honest, Swift has taken this game by the scruff of the neck and really held it up and tried to be a solo um, a solo pick man to try and open up time for the Hecarim to farm, open up objectives, which are so hard to take when you have the short-ranged Siva LeBlanc comp that they've got here. They don't have the best siege, but somebody dying, 5v4, so much easier Well, they siege. do get the kill. Spooks actually takes out Tokas as Swiffer did most of the work. Got pretty low himself as a result, but Sejuani does claim it. Okay, but it's an outer turret at maximum for the Chiefs. You don't feel like they'll be able to break the base off that pick unless they really try to push this advantage. Well, they finally get a tier 2 turret. Feels like they've been waiting for a while here, but again, Ints have kept them out for quite a long time here, and Swiffer will lead a pierce. That good black shield, though, from Rosie will keep him safe from any follow-up damage that might come through, and uh, he'll get away. Not quite level 16 yet, crucially. That's a big hitting point here for this LeBlanc, but everybody else on Ints powering up, but Swiper, maybe he's the one to watch next for the Chiefs, because that Trinity Force cannot be far away. So this is what happened off your screen. Toggle's got really DPSed out, and the ultimate 
The Flash and the Ultimate to cancel the animation. Probably wasn't sure if the Ori had the Flash of her own, but picks up the kill. Bit of a secure there coming for Spooks, but no follow-up damage there coming in as Revolta gets out Teleport. under a binding, but Swiper coming in now. Yang's going to answer, but Swiper going in massive, gets onto Macau. They dive in and get the kill onto Kalista. Drockstar goes down almost instantly, and Yang trying to find something in Megano, but even he can't last too long. Does hop over the wall. Spooks will follow him, though, and now Rosie going to look for a binding. Sw Swiper can claim blood there as Rady gets chunked up by Oriana. Rosie Rosie chasing in as Yang nars them away. They're still chasing in now when Mini now gets some speed out from the Hyper, but Swiffer going in there, closing the gap, looks for the snipe, doesn't get it. Yang getting low and will finally go down. They get the fourth kill, but already we have a respawn coming through for Minz. They'll keep wave clearing in this game. They need to pick up a big objective to start tipping this game that they've already set up so well in the first 30 minutes with a kind of unassailable lead. Still 8,000 health. It's a very healthy Baron. They need to get this flank onto Talkers. Good zoning though from Swiffer, keeping them out of the pit, but the Baron not that low at this point. They're actually taking quite a bit of damage. This is risky. Oriana Shockwave thankfully off on cooldown though. The Baron's getting low. Revolta dives in. Doesn't get it though. Now Swiffer diving through. Almost one shot. Tok is there. Spook throws an ulti over the top just for a bit of a message. And Chiefs will back off with the Baron. The Chiefs left it all on the rift. They had two smites, but still it's always a crapshoot when there's three smites involved in the situation. This is the flank that came through. In this case it was just a surprise backside initiation by the Hecarim. Didn't matter that he wasn't able to channel the first pick. They got the pick onto Kalista. She died instantly. Didn't need to really talk about the two item power spike when you're instantly dead. They turned it into a Baron, but it could have gone so wrong for the Chiefs. Yeah, Yang did a great job buying time there for his team, so the Chiefs don't quite get anything else except the Baron. So what can they do from this point? Almost 10,000 gold ahead. Looking to break down some more tarts, but Ints are holding on, and Swiper might be in some trouble. Look at these item timings. Three items now as the Sivir has the last Whisper on top of the core, the Infinity Edge and the Fan Dancer. Swiper! That's not the face check you want, not against this! Swiper does ulti out of the way, and it'll be safe for now. This time, finally manages to escape. I mean, just look at this Morgana. Righteous Glory was finished super early, snowballing from all the objectives picked up, but now an Aegis as well. That's double Aegis. Even though these are big, spread out fights, even though Swift is usually on a flank and the tanks are diving in, the, and the, but the Morgana probably gonna be next to Siva, it means that everyone on this team will be affected by the Aegis to respect the match. Oh, damage. good Shockwave coming in, insta kill! Radio. Now Swiper getting chased out as they'll no dive ultimate. onto him again. He's looking for it. He's going to maybe buy some time for Rosie to come in, but can't find it. Instead, Swiffer left to try and take out turrets in the top side, and a good double there for the Oriana. Yeah, but Swiffer has the Baron buff minion away, so picks up a kill. It's an excellent engage for Mintz, the face check, this time punishing them severely. But you can see they're not getting any objectives in trade. The chains go wide. Nope. Does he have enough damage? Mimic chain in there as well. Wow. That was not the right question to ask. The answer, though, is yes. He I does saw have a chain come up, but then I realized that was the mimic chain, and that was deletion damage by Swiffer. It must be Void Staff time. Yeah, it's not. Yep, is done now as well. Got the home guards as well for the Sork Shoes. Dragon up in a minute 10, and it's a very important one as well. Breaking point, you have to think here for the Dragons as both teams are looking for their third. Baron Up Minion still helping the Chase push out those pesky sidewaves that they've struggled with all game long. And just a massive lead now as well. And it was always that mid game team fight that Ince could win off the back of Callista's two item power spike. But since then, there's been one fight where Callista was in. Instantly picked, and now you look down the members. Frozen Heart completed, working towards some magic resistors, Swiper, Warmog's armor, and some armor completed for Spooks. How are you going to get? push those Ren stacks, how are you going to kill that first tank and get any sort of reset unless another pick is engineered? Ince have shown great proficiency at getting picks. Almost killed Hecarim once, then got the double kill. Need to do it again. Oh, but so much aggression now. Even Rosie popping his Righteous Glory going to get a flash out of the Orianna as a result. And the Chiefs, I like this play, not going straight to the Dragon yet and sending out, want to push out the ways first and try and get a kill. They don't have the Baron buff anymore, so they don't have the free siege button of those Baron buff minions coming through. In fact, no, yep, they definitely don't still have it. The Dragon's soon, but they're just looking to poke and take a turret. That's been their game plan for the last 20 minutes. Yeah, and you can see Oriana doing some nice things, positioning the ball forward to try and take out the minion waves, and the Chiefs do back away, realize that we can't really see it here. We need the Baron, so instead, let's take our other win condition, and that's trying to get the five Dragons. I mean, the other win condition, or well, the other thing to consider is, again, the wave's not really working out for them, still pushing against the one part of the game that the Chiefs haven't got a handle on this game, and Ince has looked a level above the Chiefs in minion wave control. They really have, and a great solo from Swiper 
Swiper, though, looks to get them the Dragon. Again, very creative use of that second Smite. And Swiper taking maybe a little while longer, but the Chiefs are ensuring it's a very safe solo. And look, it's quite a deceptive thing, and we talk about many ways. We don't really examine them. All I can say is if the Chiefs lose this game, you can look to the 35-minute mark, the 30-minute mark, all these times where they get a pick and can't get the big fell swoop of, say, two turrets and a massive objective. If they only get the minimum, there's always the chance that Ince get to item timings and can power down a fight. And because they've consistently had those waves prepped, they'll be the ones to get three turrets, maybe break an inhibitor, because the death timers get long enough. If the waves are in the right spot, you can get so many objectives. And the Chiefs, they've won multiple fights in a row, but they haven't broken the base. They've got the Baron, but they haven't broken the base. That's what the Chiefs need to do, and they haven't shown they can do it. Yang, though, forced to back away. So much damage coming in, almost taking out the Nar and Swiffer. We'll take a bit of poke there from the cannon, but he's back to the top side farming. But Swiffer, remember, he poked out someone with teleport, so it's definitely the minimum advantage in this case. They need to push up some wards. They have good wards around the Ents jungle, but definitely not a complete warding information. Hecarim's trying to set up a split push in the bottom lane. Does a lot of turret damage, but Nar's going to go answer him in the bot. And again, it's all this side wave control from Ents that's making all this rotation from the Chiefs look quite awkward, honestly. They've got good options. They've got LeBlanc and the Hecarim that can both split push and they can disengage well with Morgana, Sira, and Sejuani, but honestly, the execution in this stage of the game has been honestly poor from the Chiefs. Ints have done such a great job with side lanes. And that's the crazy thing for the Chiefs is it keeps going like this. There's always that potential. They misfire in a fight and lose the game. So honestly, the big question mark is, do you go for the turret dive? You have a Warmog's Locket, a Glacial Shroud, Sejuani. You've got a huge Hecarim. You have to feel if they force a fight, and at this point they can only force a fight around inhibitor turrets because basically everything else has gone down for Ints. There's always the chance you lose it, but the item timings they have relative to the item timings of the enemy, it's still likely that they can win a fight even under an inhibitor turret. Well, they do get another turret as a result, so finally all of the tier 2 turrets taken out. The other objective they can't fight around, of course, is Baron, which seems crucial to this team comp here for the Chiefs, and that's back up in 55 seconds. Maybe going to go back, spend some gold. Fates Call actually used there, I believe, onto Jox. The Radiant are forced to pop his ult defensively. And the Chiefs, again, slightly caught out in rotation there. You would have thought with all the advanced vision, they would have known that it was a bit of a bluff coming through from Jockster, but they get out the fairly short cooldown, but relevant team fight cooldown of the On The Hunt. Swift are now haunting guys as his item, maybe looking for Leandris as that last purchaser as he completes his build right here, getting stronger, building in towards a Bloodthirster now as well, and even Hecarim just piling on the tank items at this point. But the good news for Inside, I suppose, is the Chiefs won't really get that much stronger. I mean, look, it's the Baron buff into forcing objective, either hard forcing it with a dive, or for once actually getting your sideways under control. Get them under a control, Chiefs, because you've done everything else correct this game and it's they're just one step away they know they have to contest this baron even though they have no vision in the area i don't think you can give away a free baron even with the excellent wave clear that oriana provides talk is interestingly gonna get a blue buff there so swiffle will keep pushing here again the loot and zeko and all the spells doing work the chiefs get effectively a free baron here in this choice because ints just can't afford to check they actually are gonna move in revolta able to sneak in here almost but swiffer looking for a kill wants to find it onto the he support just wants to cannon. buy time i mean He's trying, but the Baron getting low. Revolta might be able to steal it. They've actually got a ward in the back, but Spooks, they're going to go in. They want to get aggressive, but Yang is going to pour it in. But Pockets goes down to Swiffer, but he gets shut down. So Macau gets the kill. Revolta getting chased. Yang in there as well, and Radiant trying to dish out the damage. But Swiper dives in as well. Massive four man prison there from Sejuani. Swiper dives in. Macau gets wrecked as the burst damage comes through from Siva. Radiant gets a double kill, and the Chiefs finally find their opening. But do they have the minion ways to actually take down one of these inhibitors? But turrets, the easy answer is no. The minion wave in the mid lane is pushing back. There still is some semblance of wave clear coming through from Revolta. Yang probably wants to transform into Meganar just for some wave clear of his own. They're going to go for the tanking of the turrets. Not a lot of damage threats, so maybe mini waves be damned. You still break the base. Yes, yeah, Swiper watered the base gate, I think, just to check Gragas coming back in. So they will finally break it. The inhib will go down as well. But Ints have done such a good job defending. Well, honestly, from about the 20-minute mark just became a one-sided affair. It's just a weird situation that the Minion Ways have really kept the Chiefs from getting any sort of advantage. If they had been on their terms, if the Minion Ways had been under control, this game would have been over 10 minutes ago. You look into the late game, can Callista get it done? Her item timings have always been 
uh, to be honest, later than the tank items coming through from the frontline of Chiefs. And that's the awkward spot for Callista, is that she's really strong with two items. She's really strong if the enemy frontline is either weak or squishy or just behind in items. But neither of those things are true. And she has to respect her Hecarim. Speaking Jockster of respect. gets one shot there by Swiffer as a quick combo comes in. Spooks base plates the wall due to the Revolta's ulti there. And now Spooks going to get chased out as well. Swiffer maybe wants it. The ulti does come through there. But a bit of poke damage comes in and a one-for-one one trade. And the one-for-one one is excellent for Enz. It's the jungler, the CC tank that's very tanky. Sejuani for the support cannon who also has the shorter death timer will be up soon. Spooks not being alive. Got to go get those minion waves under control. I feel like I've been saying that for the last 20 minutes, but it's the only thing holding the Chiefs back from a victory. And you buy time, you misfire in a fight, and Ents can still win. Swiffer diving in, wants to get Macau, almost takes him out with another quick combo. LeBlanc doing ridiculous damage at this stage. Might even go in for a Volta. Pops it, gets the chains down as well, just lands on the end. Swiffer going to keep going. No, actually, dodges a couple of pieces, still diving through, but Revolta quite tanky on the Gragas. Not sure about that tether range. was massive, absolutely. Felt like a niddly spin spear of tether coming through from the LeBlanc. But I mean, Chiefs just have no more ideas. This is maybe where their strategic gameplay is falling down, is that they, they've broken the base in top. They look at their mini waves. They're not there. They walk towards Baron. It's already been a 50-50 Baron previously. Baron would completely undo almost all their work this game, because suddenly the super minions wouldn't mean much. They're working towards a fourth dragon. It's a sad state of affairs where a fifth dragon is a needed win condition given how far ahead they were this game. But honestly, it looks necessary for the Chiefs. That is, look, does look necessary. But we'll see if they can close out the game with the lead they have. And even though the Goldie will start to diminish in terms of value, even though the difference will likely stay at about the 10,000 mark for most of this game, even if Ints do start turning it back around, when they start winning, it'll be with this deficit. That will even out eventually because people have enough gold. And even maybe scarier than that, making mistakes when the death time are this long and the mini wave controls been this good from Ince. That's the real killer here for the Chiefs. And the Banshee's Veils are coming. That's one of the best items to deal with LeBlanc. Stops those big combos from being instant death combos. I mean, the Spell Shield and this, I mean, the Health and Magic Resist, to be honest, really is the most effective pickup against the LeBlanc. So, I mean, it is QSS from, this, from the Callista, but if that can turn into a Banshee at some point, they have a lot of options. Swift is looking to split push. This could be 5v4 action under the Baron. Yeah, his team's on the Baron there, so they will have to back off but this, they're trying to get a turret. He's got the a lot of AP. Yeah, I mean, that turret's dead now. Even no Lich Bane there, but just enough damage. The cannon creep coming in as well. Is that a banner of command? It is, Rosie, who banner of commanded up the creep there in the bottom side. Dot is able to get the turret. Baron getting low there as the Chiefs keep forcing Ince to fight them off. But it, this but is much smarter from the Chiefs. Couldn't get the minion waves under control, but very smart. And the, Baron, the banner of command actually very relevant. Yes, smart stuff there, although the ball will go in there. Has to be careful. Swiffer will find Yang, but oh. just deletes the Nah. Now the Baron gonna get low uh. as well, but Rosie's owning them away. Swiper diving in over the top. Spooks gets in there as well. The cannon ulti is proc there, and Swiffer gonna find the support cannon and almost take him out through Exhaust. The Fade Skull keeps him alive. Spooks, though, still taking all the damage, but Macau starting to get hits on a good Zonis there from top. Radius keeps him from alive. The team. He's okay now though, but Swiffer round the side, gets a double kill, takes out Orian Cannon. Now Macau gonna come in. Swiffer might line up a triple here and does, and that might be it here. Four kills to zero for the Chiefs. Yeah, two super minion waves pushing. This should be the game, and Swiffer, one thing you can say, Ince did their homework, banned out the Maokai, banned out the Scion, but Hecarim's looking great. You could have seen that in game one, and Swiffer gets his LeBlanc, and it's a sight to behold. Revolta goes down as well. No, he will stay alive, gets back to the base, but the Nexus will fall down and the Chiefs will beat Ince their 2-0 now in the tournament. And what a performance from Swiffer in the mid lane. LeBlanc on patch 5.6, 5.7. You can see Swiper giving a big hug. This game was all about Swiffer. Equalized the fact that it was patch 5.7 LeBlanc and the tank meta. We always say, if you're going to pick LeBlanc on this patch pastry time, you need to make it happen. You need to get the solo kills. You need to make the pressure. And he did it all. That was all on the back of Swiffer. He really did. And a wonderful looking game there for the Chiefs, taking out one of the toughest looking teams here at the tournament. But we can look towards the later stages of that game. And we kept talking about the mini wave control, struggling to close it out. And especially in a longer series, if they are looking towards the playoff section of the tournament, they can't afford games to drag out that long. And you have to feel like in their first series, they showed an exploitable weakness at the level one, falling behind 
another team could have really taken that game by the horns and won that first game, but were able to farm up on late game power spikes and take it out. In this game, another weakness that they showed was their minion wave control isn't up to the standard of the top teams in the world. Another thing for them to work on, but they're getting the victories on the board. They've taken down Ince. That's the only time these two teams will meet in the uh, round robin stage. So, I mean, that's an important victory to take, and they'll have so much confidence going into their last set of the game later today. Yeah, good notch in the belt there for the Chiefs, but Ince, I mean, played great. You can see why they were one of the favoured teams moving in. Couldn't quite get everything going. You saw what they wanted to do, but poor Oriana, who would have thought had a fine matchup there with the counter pick. Spooks, as he almost always is in a lot of situations, was there for Swiffer once again. And once he got a foothold in the game, LeBlanc just kept going. And I guess the thing you have to mention, Swiffer beat a LeBlanc on Oriana in game one. And now in his second performance, completely took out an Oriana on the reverse matchup. What does that say about the sort of confidence and just mechanical skill from Swiffer on these majors? Been on this lineup, been in the world scene for a long time, but finally really showing it with a plum with such an impressive performance. You know, maybe we'll check out a little bit more of it as well. We do have a replay here from the last game as well. And it is the last crazy fight of the game, Bubba Smith. And there was multiple crazy fights. And I think the craziness will be some of the burst damage coming from Swiffer. So that's just, before we roll the tape, look at how many bars there is on that guy's health. That's Yang at this point. Randuin's Warm sorry, Randuin's Banshee Veil Sunfire. So it could have had more items at this point, but still super tanky. And this is a LeBlanc, not known for a tank killing ability. Has six items. Maybe that'll be relevant as we roll the <laughs> tape. So coming through, just wait for this meme. He just... <laughs> He literally did yeah. two and a half thousand damage instantly. Yeah, and it, it keeps going. I mean, the fight keeps going at this point. But remember, this is already the front line down. Gonna need Nar to fight around these areas. Exhaust at this point, Fate Score makes them untargetable. This fight is actually looking decent. Suddenly, Macau is free hitting, but Swiffer exits the screen at this point. You can see on the minimap showing up on the right. It's an instant double kill with just. The, the distortion coming through. They chase onto Macau, take him out. And even if you can never prep your minion waves, as you can see, there was a red minion wave pushing in the top turret. If you can win fights like that, doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the smart stuff definitely in there. The Chiefs sort of figured out that we need to find a way to actually break this base. What we're trying to do is not working. So a smart split push there. I have to say the one big thing for me throughout that whole series was the Chiefs used both their smites very effectively. Absolutely, but they opted into risky situations. We didn't even mention taking the Baron 50-50 against a Gragas. Three smites, one of them on a top laner who won't necessarily have the same smite mechanics as a jungler. Anything could have happened in that situation. So the fact that they picked it up while being clutch, it's a risky thing to choose into 50-50. But the top teams in the world do. We see Chinese teams doing it all the time. When it works, you look back at it and say, well, that was a necessary risk. But it could have gone oh so much more different. Yeah, and again, we'll definitely see if they clean some things up. But early game, again, didn't fall behind this time. That was the big thing for me. Kept it nice and even. And when it got to the mid game, all of a sudden, it's the same team that we've been seeing dominate regionally. And they were behind the two dragons, took their laning advantage, took the gold lead. They had about 3,000 gold around the time the third dragon spawned and got back into it, prepped the vision. Remember, they had three pink wards around the dragon for their first to be taken. There had already been two taken by... Uh, the opponent inst at that point, but they took the dragon. They made the dragon even a win condition after being too behind in the early levels. So if the Baron hadn't gone well, there was always the fifth dragon to visit. You felt like eventually they padded their resume enough. They finally had the resume to be that world beater when they prepped the dragon, but that's the thing. It felt like if there was just a bit more scaling, if it was instead of Callista, a different hypercarry like a Jinx who can really take over those late game team fights. It could have been a different result for the Chiefs. And I think we look back and, I mean, I think we're going to start seeing some LeBlanc bans there. I mean, Swiffer already draws a lot of LeBlanc bans in general, but I think some other teams might be looking at that game and being like, maybe we should ban this away. But for me personally, how many times, how many more times, sorry, is Swiper going to be given Hecarim? And that's the thing. Swiper's defying conventions. You do your research on someone like Swiper, you look at the OPL split. I mean, he just, did, he just played tanks. He played Sion Maokai basically religiously. Those champions were banned out to him. The Sion bans in particular, one of the most banned champions in the OPL, I believe, was Sion. So you could be comfortable for thinking, okay, let's give him the Hecarim. He hasn't shown any prowess on these more carry-oriented top champions, but Hecarim does everything. That's kind of the disgusting thing about the champion is he's super tanky, has an excellent initiation. He does big burst damage. And if you go for this smite teleport build, I mean, he's just so reliable at blowing up an enemy AD carry or rendering them completely useless. What is a Callista with Hurricane going to do when a Cinder Hulk 
a Trinity Force Hecarim jives at them. I mean, there's nothing you can do unless you have massive peel for your team. And peeling the Onslaught of Shadows, difficult. The burst damage, considerable. And if it's, you're isolated, you just can't DPS down with a team fight build. A big tanky Hecarim. And that for me shows in the priority that they've shown. I believe that's two games in a row now that they've just first picked it straight away wanted to make sure they get it. And you do have to justify the pick A by performing on it but B having your team play around it to the point where you get strong. But twice now Chiefs have played games on Hecarim and that's twice they've gotten to that position. But we do have another replay here as well as we're going to delve a little bit deeper into the rest of the game. It's a little bit earlier this time, Papa. So this is when they had the Goldie. This is the third dragon fight I alluded to. So they prepped this with Vision. They had pink wards around the area they didn't have any dragons on the mark but they indicated the third one's the one they want to fight to that's the when the stats really start to get relevant the five percent movement speed can undo a lot of situations because you pick it up suddenly you rotate smarter suddenly everything goes well suddenly cannon's able to close in on a fight that much better with the extra move speed so we'll, we'll roll the tape at this one they're in great position they're a five-man group in this situation as the hecarim ult comes through the engage comes through from the cannon doesn't get much work done but again swiffer focus fire they focus onto the cannon kill them instantly so it's already a 5v4 situation Macau's doing smart things but he's kiting unfortunately towards three tanky members he doesn't have any peel from his team despite the fact this is the gragas so you have to wonder why Gragas not holding onto that cc to really set up the cannon but we do an but before we go in we have do have an interview with swiffer with teams of the tournament how confident do you feel right now Oh, like at the moment, we're just, we're so confident. Um, honestly, like we expected this to be our hardest match and having won it, like just ecstatic at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Okay, LeBlanc performance was incredible. Your performance was incredible. Do you expect any bans on LeBlanc for the next matches? I mean, like m maybe, maybe we shouldn't have shown it so soon, but um I expect I, I do expect it to be banned, but uh, hopefully not, so that I can continue to to do really well. Um, I mean, if it is banned, like we've got plenty more prepared, so it's fine. So, yeah. so did you practice any special strategy on ints? Um, our draft phase was prepared really well by our analysts. Like we knew we scouted what they really wanted to do, like uh, recently with their team compositions and everything like that. Uh, so in that respect, yeah, we prepared like considerably for them, probably more than any other team. Um, and once we kind of took that composition away from them, um, we didn't really know what they play, but <laughs> <laughs> we didn't really know. But uh, it was fine because uh, that was their strongest comp, I, I feel, and we were able to deal with this one. So yeah. Do you want to say anything to your fans or to your supp supporters? Uh, first of all, to everyone watching in OCE, thanks for sticking around so long, even though it's some kind of ungodly hour over there at the moment. Uh, yeah, just major uh, shout out to our sponsor Logitech and our managing staff, Frank and Amy, and obviously everyone else on this team. Oh, and Riot Games for hosting this event. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the interview, and now we're back to Chris. Man, Swift there with a Spartan performance. A lot of confidence there coming out now. And I mean, that's the thing for the Chiefs. They're definitely a team that can play emotionally swift for especially, but after a LeBlanc game like that, I'd be ecstatic too. And I'm plugging the sponsors, carrying games, all looking good for Swiffer. Oceanic teams have been in this position before, we remember, though they often have these strong starts. Can they keep it up and actually power their way towards the finals? MSI looms for a team like the Chiefs, but it's only two games in. They have to secure it with consistent performance. Well, we'll have to find out later. The Chiefs, a strong start to the event, but plenty more games to come. We're going to take another break, but when we return, the coverage of the IWCI will be here.